Uh, good morning. A warm welcome to the Humanist Community in Silicon Valley Sunday Forum. To those joining us on Zoom and to those joining us on Facebook. My name is Alex Havasey. I'm Vice President of the Humanist Community. The Humanist Community is a chapter of the American Humanist Association. Humanism is a secular reality-based philosophy of life that affirms, that affirms our ability and responsibility to lead ethical lives of personal fulfillment that aspire to the greater good. We value freedom, health, happiness, fairness, compassion, and using science and reason to acquire and apply knowledge. And scroll down a bit here. Um, if these words describe your thinking, we invite you to become a member of the community, humanist community if you haven't done so already. Membership forms are available on our website, humanist.org. That's humanistporal.org. Uh, special welcome to those who are with us for the first time. We invite you to continue listening to our weekly forums and other events. You can find our events listed on the website, humanist.org. Uh, we're also on um, meetup at uh, meetup.com slash humanist community. Please aid us in continuing to present these forums by, by donating to the humanist community. You can find out how to donate on our to our organization, our, our website at, again, humanist.org. Um, today, we're going to uh, listen to um, uh, Jeff Chestis, uh, who will present a talk on um, uh, uh, approval voting. Jeff's a, uh, uh, studied physics and engineering economy at Stanford. Um, He's worked for Justice Innovations, uh, Nelson Analytical, and Hewlett Packard. Um, he's now a um, board member at the Center for Elec Election Science and an organizer with Cal California's approval, California Approves. Uh, so, Jeff, would you would you take a screen? Great. Uh, thanks for inviting me back to talk about my favorite subject. Uh, I could easily talk for five hours on this, but I have 36 slides, and I hope that this takes 35 minutes to do, and then we'll have about 10 minutes of talk of uh, questions at the end. Um, a lot of the, about half the slides are slides that I used in the last meeting, but half of them are, um, are new, so there has been progress. And I will share my screen now. Uh, it is screen two. Okay, you can see that one. That's the first slide. So I'm a member of the Center for Election Science, which is a national organization that promotes better voting methods, but in particular approval voting. And since I talked last, uh, California Approves has been formed to bring approval voting to California. And I'm one of the organizers for that. This picture was taken with me and a couple of the board uh, staff members at St. Louis. Uh, I studied um, decision analysis as it affects financial decisions at Stanford. And uh, voting is, is related to that. It's called social choice system, uh, and, uh, methods as opposed to uh, financial choice methods. Uh, so it was sort of a natural that I would drift into voting methods. But the main reason I got into it is that there's such a huge improvement that could be made to our democracy with some, such a simple change. So let's get started. Yeah. So so this is the overall thesis. Uh, current voting method uh, often decides the outcome uh, by the um, uh, by the the random mix of candidates instead of the will of the people. That's called vote splitting. Uh, and because of fear of vote splitting, a lot of people end up not running. Good people that should run. And indirectly, this causes two parties to become dominant, which affects everything in our society. Uh, and society becomes polarized, as we've seen. So that's the overall idea. Now I'm going to go into some specifics for about five or six slides. And we'll talk about uh, your most famous 
Well, no, before we begin, let's make sure that we got everybody going by covering the basics. What is approval voting? So I have a two minute video uh, just to cover the basics. Uh, this is, uh, what is approval voting? What is approval voting? Oh, oops. And I'm going to, uh, this is a video playing on my computer. Um, raise your hand if you can't, if you can't hear it properly. Oops. No. What is approval voting? Simply put, it's a better way to run an election. Let's take a trip to Plantsville. It's election time and Mayor Blueberry is campaigning hard for a second term in office. She won the last election with 65% against her opponent, Mr. Squash, and she still enjoyed strong support. Once again, Mr. Squash is quick to challenge Ms. Blueberry, but this time they're joined by a third challenger, Mr. Peach, who shares similar views with Mayor Blueberry. Mr. Peach sweet talks almost half of Blueberry's supporters into switching their vote to him, while Mr. Squash holds the same 35% he had last time. The votes are counted. And what's this? Mr. Squash wins? Blueberry and Peach have split the fruit vote. How did this happen? Peach's supporters also like Blueberry, but couldn't say so on their ballot. A simple solution is to change the ballot from vote for one to vote for one or more, allowing everyone to state all the candidates they support. This is called approval voting. With approval voting, the election would have gone quite differently. Peach's supporters no longer fear that a vote for Peach will help elect Squash. Instead, they show their sincere support for Peach and also Blueberry. They want to prevent Mr. Squash from winning, and they do. And approval voting accurately reflects Peach's support. Mayor Blueberry wins the election. Democracy is restored. Approval voting is more than just a smart idea in Plantsville. It's a smart idea anywhere you vote. Approval voting is used by organizations across the globe, and for good reason. It's democratic because the candidate with the most support wins. It removes the spoiler effect. Even losing candidates get an accurate reflection of support. And voting your favorite never hurts you. Start the conversation on approval voting and share this video. Then join the Center for Election Science at electology.org. Better voting starts with you. Jeff, do you have any other videos? Or is this the only one? That's the only one. Okay, good, thank you. Okay, that's the simplest way to, uh, to get you to know what approval voting is. Uh, and did it, I saw one hand go up, but I didn't stop the video. Hopefully you heard it well enough. Um, uh, so we start off with everybody's favorite election uh, 2016 presidential election. Uh, this is how the popular vote came out. And the pundits uh, just love to analyze this and say, what if this, what if that? Uh, what if the uh, libertarian candidate hadn't run? Would his votes have gone to Trump? Uh, there's probably some liber libertarians in the audience. And uh, um, you, you can do a lot of what ifs like that. Um, um, but uh, it, another way of looking at it is that it doesn't really matter because our constitution doesn't use the popular vote anyway. Uh, it uses the electoral vote. Uh, but even there, quite a few states would have flipped if there was just 1% change between Clinton and Trump. Uh, and so uh, a one per, uh, Johnson and Stein in their race may or may, or may, or may not have influenced the out, outcome. But what I wanna do is talk about something that you don't even think about very much, which is whether Trump would have been the nominee at all uh, or how he got to be the nominee. Because if you remember in 2015, there were 17 people running for the Republican nomination. Uh, and, they, and that uh, nomination period went on for over a year. 
And we're lucky because Gallup poll and Wall Street Journal polled Republicans during that time almost every month and asked them who they're going to vote for. And another question they ask is who could they support? So we have that data uh, from 19, from those polls and I plotted it, well, my, my organization plotted it on the next page. Uh, this is the results of the question, uh, who will you vote for uh, of Republicans? And you see there's 17 Republicans that ran and uh, Trump jumped into the race uh, in uh, April of 2015. Uh, and um, uh, he, uh, he got a lot of press at the beginning. He, and by July, he was in first place with the, who are you going to vote for? But first place meant only 20% of the Republicans would vote for him. And uh, uh, by March of 2016, the big, uh, uh, the big uh, pre-election occurred and uh, a lot of people, a lot of Republican candidates dropped out and Trump uh, rose to the top and got the Republican nomination. So that's uh, choose one voting. Now, what we have though is data from the question, who could you support? And the Republicans were allowed to answer uh, with more than one answer there. Uh, so uh, they could vote for, uh, they could support four or five candidates for instance. And this is the result of that poll. Um, again, uh, now, Trump is the purple line right here. And at the beginning, uh, this one is uh, Carson, I think was in the, in the lead at the beginning. Uh, Ted Cruz was, I forget which, which color is which here. But the main thing is that, first of all, approvals, uh, uh, who could you support is up there in the 60% range. And Trump, at the end, a lot of the candidates dropped out uh, but Trump never rises past second place. So we have evidence that Trump would not have been the Republican nominee under approval voting. And the reason I bring this up is that we often forget about the primaries, but a lot of the action occurs in the primaries. The average person running for Congress, uh, the, on average, there, there are seven people uh, running for a congressional seat. And it often gets, if it's a Republican seat, only the Republicans uh, have a chance. And so whoever wins the Republican nomination wins and vice versa for Democrat. Uh, so we tend to forget about the primaries, but they are they're critical. But I'm gonna go on to things that we do see, uh, some other famous elections. And uh, this is one uh, that, uh, that stands out very clearly. Uh, uh, most people believe that the Nader supporters would, would have voted for Gore if, uh, if he wasn't on the ballot, but that's, that's debatable. Um, uh, the main thing is, well, uh, another interesting fact, there, there's some evidence that the support for Nader would have been around 20% if you are allowed to vote for Nader, but a vote for Nader uh, could backfire on you and end up electing Bush. So Nader didn't get any indication of what his real support was because people were afraid to, to vote for him. Uh, so that, that's one way that the random uh, list of candidates on a, uh, on a ballot can af affect the election more than the will of the people. Now, I've been, I was a child of Vietnam, so I was traumatized uh, by uh, this election and the one that followed. <laughs> um, so if you remember, Abraham Lincoln was a Republican and uh, Republicans had never won the South since the Civil War. But in uh, 1968, George Wallace formed an independent party and uh, uh, he swept the so Southern states, which took enough votes away from the Democrats uh, to give the election to Nixon. Uh, 
So that's a standard vote split. Uh, um, and this has been going on for a long time. Uh, in your history class, you probably know about the 2012 election where Teddy Roosevelt got mad at the incumbent Howard Taft and formed his own party. And he ended up splitting the progressive vote. He beat the, uh, Howard Taft, uh, but uh, uh, this, with this progressive vote split, he wasn't able to uh, beat Woodrow Wilson. Um, and just to go back further in history, oh, uh, by the way, th this is why good people don't run. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt was a good person, but by him running, he ends up throwing the election to the person they don't want the election to go to. Oh. Um, popular, uh, uh, politicians know about this and they use it to their effect. So even back in 1884, Grover Cleveland was supporting the prohibition candidate just so that candidate could suck uh, votes away from, from Blaine, his opponent. Uh, but that's enough history. Um, now I want to talk about a modern election. Uh, St. Louis City uh, is a democratic city in a Republican state. And in the 2017 Democratic primary, uh, they had seven people running for mayor. Uh, since it's a democratic city, whoever wins the primary becomes mayor. Uh, the Republican basically doesn't have a chance. Um, so seven people, possibly the vote could be split seven ways. Um, and, and so significant vote splitting can occur. Um, so th this is just seven names to you. Uh, what I know uh, that you don't know is, uh, is the pictures of the people that are running. Uh, so there were uh, uh, five African Americans and two uh, European Americans running in a city that's majority African American. And so you might guess what, what happened. Uh, the African Americans split the vote and this is how the choose one votes came out. Uh, so the, the European American ended up winning the race with 32% of the vote. And the second place uh, um, African American got 30%. Uh, so the, uh, this can be framed as a uh, uh, social, uh, social justice issue too. It's just one of the ways of looking at this. Uh, well, this was so blatant that the citizens of St. Louis organized to try to change the system to prevent this from happening in the future. And they uh, uh, put together an initiative to, that, that they voted on in November 2020. And it was passed by 68% of the St. Louis voters to convert to approval voting. That was in November of 2020. Now their first mayor's race was uh, February, 2021. And so the ballots went out just two months later. So this is incredibly easy to implement. The only thing different on the ballot is that you change the rules at the top from vote for one to vote for as many as you approve of. Uh, there's no change to voting machines. Counting the ballots is trivial. Um, uh, rules, uh, teaching the voters what to do is trivial also. Uh, um, so they had four people uh, running for mayor this time. Uh, the, the incumbent mayor decided not to run. And uh, so possibly these four people could split the vote, uh, but it's approval voting now. So you can, on average, they voted for 2.2 people per ballot. And this is how the election came out. Uh, in this case, 57% uh, uh, of the people approved of Tishwara Jones, 46% uh, for Kara Spencer. And then you could say that Lewis Reed and Andrew Jones lost the election, but 
at least in losing, they know what their support was. And that is a strong purpose of elections too, is to give you an indication of the support of the candidates that didn't make it to the top, because these people might come back in the future or they might've had some good ideas. Um, so that's a strong point of approval voting is that you get an indication of the support of the candidates that didn't make it to the top. So that's enough talking about existing, uh, existing elections uh, or elections that have already happened. Uh, this is just a summary of, of what we're talking about here. Elections are often decided by the random selection of candidates instead of the will of the people. And this causes society to become polarized. So the next slides are about ways of fixing it. And I divide the methods into patches and converting uh, conversions to a different system altogether. Um, so let's talk about patches first. Uh, the first is that you, if you can get the number of candidates down to two, uh, then choose one voting works fine. Uh, so you just put barriers up. You, Make, make people pay a lot of money or collect a lot of signatures to get on the ballot. Uh, the U.S. does that a lot. And nothing in our constitution says that we have to have primaries, but almost every place has primaries now just to narrow the field. A few places have runoffs. They're, they're useful too. And a, a number of cities have converted to instant runoff voting, which uh, always comes up in talks like this. So I have about four or five slides on instant runoff voting. Um, uh, instant runoff voting has been around for about 150 years. It, it's one type of ranked choice voting. And it's been adopted in uh, several cities and in the state of Maine and recently in Alaska. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about the implementation. Um, this is the state of Maine's uh, ballot uh, in 2016 when they had seven people running uh, in the Democratic primary. And you have to have an eighth column, an eighth row uh, for the right end. So voters are uh, faced with an eight by eight spreadsheet uh, to uh, to fill out. Um, and if you have uh, 46 candidates like we did in the recent recall election in California, then you'd have a 47 by 47 spreadsheet to fill out. Uh, um, so uh, th that might be worth it if, if it actually solved the problem, but it turns out that you can get splits in the, in the counting process that that cause weird things to happen. And the most famous split, well, it's happened many times, uh, was in Burlington, Vermont. Uh, they enacted uh, instant runoff voting in 2008 and had their first election with it in 2009 with three candidates. And uh, instant runoff voting ended up splitting the vote and the least favorite candidate won. Now, this is called the center squeeze effect. And it can squeeze the center out and the extremes get in. Uh, so uh, uh, Burlington, uh, Vermont repealed instant runoff voting shortly thereafter. And that's happened in several cities. Uh, again, this doesn't happen all the time. Um, but when it does, it's, it's quite painful to see that, that the system elects uh, uh, a candidate that is not the, uh, demonstrably not the favorite. Um, now, San Francisco and Oakland enacted uh, uh, instant runoff voting around 2004. And Gavin Newsom was a city councilman at the time and he wrote uh, the, the ballot language for being against uh, against the change, he said that the cure is worse than the disease. 
um, Jerry Brown was the uh, mayor of Oakland and he uh, is not a favor of it either. He's vetoed some laws on instant runoff voting. But the people that uh, support instant runoff voting are quite well funded. And uh, they uh, got it on the ballot for Massachusetts in 2020 uh, to convert the whole state uh, to uh, instant runoff voting, just like Maine is converted. And uh, they spent over $10 million to uh, get uh, instant runoff voting passed in Maine and ended up with 45% uh, of the vote in Maine. Uh, the opposition people spent $9,000. Uh, so the word is starting to leak out that there, is, there are issues with instant runoff voting. Uh, it's such a cool algorithm. Uh, seems like it ought to work, but it's got issues. Uh, uh, it, it improves a, a few things uh, and it's been around for a long time. Uh, but uh, the, uh, in addition to the complexity and the vote splitting, it's very difficult to audit. So typically the registrar of voters takes 1% of the votes afterwards and recounts them to make sure that everything works, that worked properly. Well, uh, uh, instant runoff voting is not additive. So it, uh, it, if you count 1%, it could be a different winner than if you counted all the ballots. Um, uh, in fact, if North, the North part of the city votes for John Smith and the South part for John Smith, when you add them together, you can't approve that, uh, assume that John Smith won for the whole city. Uh, you mathematicians may know that, that's some additive feature of, of voting. Uh, so um, that's enough of instant runoff voting. Uh, a talk on voting methods should not pass over the world's most popular voting method. And I can say that with certainty because it's the most common one used on the internet. It's called score voting. It's also used in the Olympics. And that's what I learned for making financial decisions. Uh, when you're deciding where to put your money, you find the place with the highest interest rate and you put your money there. Uh, on the internet, it's often implemented as five stars. And it's got a, uh, and you vote um, zero to five stars on, uh, and then uh, Amazon summarizes that with the average number of stars for every item. Uh, it's a good system. Uh, there's a reason why it's so popular. Uh, here's the pros and cons of it. It does uh, uh, pretty, it, it stops vote splitting and spoilers, it's pretty simple. Um, quite often you don't need to change your voting machines. Uh, you can always vote to your favorite. Uh, if you're a third party, you get some indication of your real support. Um, and we would recommend it if you have elections with less than about 50 uh, voters. Um, but when you get up to hundreds or thousands of voters, it turns out that choose one voting does about the same thing as score voting, just through statistics. Now that's because some voters can't decide on two or three stars for every candidate. And so they just say, oh, I approve of them or I don't approve of them. And you use this statistical uh, spread on that uh, as an indication. So uh, score voting becomes approval voting uh, for uh, systems with large numbers of voters. And approval voting uh, is simple and has a lot of advantages. Uh, so we'll talk a little bit about approval voting. Uh, so the, the big advantage is that your ballot looks just like it does now. You just change vote for one to vote for one or more or vote for as many as you want might be better. Uh, Facebook uses it. If you've done the doodle poll before, you use it. The United Nations uses it. The Vatican used it for electing the Pope. Uh, Venice, uh, Italy used it for about 500 years uh, before Napoleon took over. Um, but it fell out of use. It's like it was forgotten. Well, it, 
at least in governments. Uh, so it's only used in two cities right now in the U.S., which is sort of amazing. It's used in Fargo and St. Louis. Uh, so it's, a jo it's our job to uh, get that up uh, and get the number of cities using it up. Uh, um, so let's talk about its pros and cons. Simplicity is one of the uh, pros. Uh, uh, it, it cuts down on vote splitting and spoilers, doesn't let you, uh, you don't have to change your voting machines. Uh, you can always vote to your favorite. I put that as an issue because sometimes voting for your favorite under instant runoff voting can actually hurt them. So you have to be a little strategic with uh, instant runoff voting. Uh, third parties get some indication of how good they're doing. It's very easy to audit and count the votes. Uh, uh, fewer spoil spoiled ballots. If you currently under choose one, if you vote for two people, they throw the ballot out. Under approval voting, that would be a valid ballot. Uh, uh, the cons, uh, people get nervous because it's only been used in two cities. Uh, but it has been used throughout history and it has been well studied by professors. Now, so I'll show on the next slide. Interesting, another thing that uh, is a little disconcerting is that you don't get to express your degree of, a, of approval. You just have to decide yes or no. Um, so it'd be nice if you could say, oh, I, this is a four star candidate or a three star. And I can see that, that con, uh, you didn't, instead you just say, yeah, he's, a, he's okay, or he's not okay. Um, so uh, you're relying on your fellow citizens to, to do a statistical average so that, uh, so that it works out okay. Um, <laughs> uh, if you do like to do, express a degree of approval, then we'd recommend score voting. Uh, but in general, that's not needed. Um, now, approval voting, these are the people that uh, did the uh, groundwork on it. Uh, various political scientists and even a Nobel Prize winner. Uh, uh, they did the simulations about 50 years ago that showed that uh, uh, just how nice approval, how well-behaved approval voting is. And, uh, uh, and you can see this uh, panel presentation on the election science uh, website. They also wrote a book called Approval v Voting. So it's been well studied by academia. Uh, and it's been, uh, ever since we got computers, we can do a lot more studying than, than back in the Venice days when they just had to guess at the best way of voting. Um, a lot of the theory on uh, d democracy was done done certainly by the, our founding fathers, but by the uh, French went to democracy. And so there are uh, uh, quite a few voting things with French names on them, but let's continue on with ways of learning. Um, uh, if you Google it, you'll find a large number of uh, podcasts and, and videos now on approval voting and voting methods in general. And, um, and um, this one at the bottom here, Duverger's law is one of those French laws that I told you about. Uh, choose one system uh, will tend to polarize society and society will break into two main parties. Um, uh, that law was made up by some Frenchmen in the 1800s uh, and uh, it certainly plays out. Uh, right after we wrote the Constitution, immediately we, vote, we broke into two parties, and it's been very difficult to get third parties started since then. So, uh, 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 we've uh, the national uh, nonprofit that uh, promotes approval voting better voting methods in general, but in particular approval voting is called the Center for Election Science. And they have a very good website with 
a huge number of articles now and videos and podcasts. Um, so uh, I hope that you go there to find out more. Uh, uh, they're the national organization, a nonprofit, uh, but since I gave the talk last, uh, various organizations have started up around the country to bring approval voting to uh, individual states and cities. And this is one that is of particular interest right now. Uh, Seattle has uh, uh, just collected the signatures to put an initiative on the uh, ballot for November to convert to approval voting. Uh, we can learn a lot from Seattle um, about, they're very progressive. About five, 10 years ago, they invented this way of funding candidates uh, automatically. And as a result, the number of people running for mayor of Seattle averages around 12. And so they, they've seen how the, the vote gets split 12 ways and you end up becoming mayor with 20% uh, of the vote. And so they really understand the importance of approval voting as the number of candidates go up. Uh, we've done studies now and the average number of people running for Congress U.S. Congress is seven uh, per race. Um, so uh, uh, approval voting is polling at 74% of the people say they'll vote for this initiative in Seattle. And we've done polls now in uh, a dozen states uh, and it polls around 70% uh, approval. Once people understand what this could do, they, they say, yeah, uh, uh, 70% say they would support it. Uh, so now we're in the point of where, yeah, we've got support. It's a good idea. We have gotta make it happen. And uh, that's what a, a California approves has been formed to do um, to bring approval voting to California. Uh, the, the groundwork has been done. Uh, it made a big improvement at almost no cost but you got to have activists to go out and actually spread the word. And uh, uh, you need, eventually you need some money too. Uh, so uh, right now the activists are harder to get than the money. <laughs> uh, okay, that's my talk. Um, I can, I, I'll stop the, I'll ask for questions first and then I'll, I'll stop the uh, slide pre presentation Anybody need to look at any of the old slides or anything? I'll stop now. Yeah. Um, Can you show the slides with uh, instant runoff voting? Okay. Oh. So screen two, share, okay. And there were about five slides on instant runoff voting. Here's the beginning of them. I always hate it when there's technical issues. <laughs> If it's sharing, Jeff, go ahead and stop sharing for a moment till you get it. Yeah, ready that's to go. probably the best thing to do. Yeah. Okay. Uh, um, I can bring up the slides again. It'll just take a, a little bit of time, is all. Uh, yeah. Um, uh, can I? Uh, any questions? Uh, Um, Can you uh, compare approval voting with runoff voting, but not the instant variety, the one where you have a runoff, let's say two weeks after uh, the first round? Oh yeah, that, that's a good question. 
because um, approval voting by itself can be used with primaries and it can be used with runoffs. That's still an option. It doesn't force you to give up primaries and runoffs. And in fact, there's still an audio, uh, a question as to whether some people I think uh, like primaries and runoffs. So it's a good idea. Uh, so um, uh, runoffs um, probably are unnecessary. Uh, you, you could argue that primaries are unnecessary with approval voting, uh, uh, but you've got to have a way of teaching the, the citizens about who's running. And so for that reason, having primaries is valuable. Um, but basically whoever gets the most approval after the election is the winner and you don't have to have a, a runoff, um, mm -hmm. but it might still be valuable to have a primary and you don't have to let, just let two people through on the primary. You can let four or five through on the primary and have them in the general election. Uh, in fact, there, there's some advantages to that. I, I would sort of recommend that for California's primaries. In fact, is approval voting in the primary, let four or five people through and then have four or five people in the general. Uh, okay. <laughs> I guess I was thinking about it, you know, in the context of not using approval voting, just the uh, run of voting. What, oh, what is the efficacy and what is, what is the comparative accuracy? Are there spoiler effects? You know, that, that sort of thing. Runoff is definitely better than just a plain old choose one system. Um, and it would come, it'd be getting closer to approval voting, uh, but it's extra effort and takes extra time. So it's a, it's better, but than plain old, a plain old election with no runoff, but I would go with approval voting first. It's so easy to do. I had a question about, um, <clears throat> Sorry, am I? Yeah, I had a question about um, one of the comments you made about um, uh, an objection that um, some method was not precinct, precinct summable, which I think was a phrase on a, the slide. Now, I assume that means you just count the number of votes and see if it's greater than the number of candidates. And I, I should think that would be a problem with approval voting also. There's no easy way to tell whether you've got more votes coming than you should. Is that so what you're with, let, let's say you have uh, four precincts uh, with approval voting. Each precinct can count up their own ballots and then send it to the central uh, registrar voters and they can just add them together and get the results. Uh, you can't do that with uh, instant runoff voting because it's not precinct summable. And that tends to make instant runoff voting much harder to audit. Uh, Oh, I see. You mean you've, you've really got to have the whole count before you can determine who to drop. They have to all be in one spot and run through a single uh, counting system uh, to... Uh, uh. Okay. Uh, Jim and Fran, I see you've got your hand up. And you're muted. Uh, I can't. Yeah, there. Couldn't get it unmuted. Um, in this country where there are two major parties and in several other countries, I guess, where there are two major parties, uh, it, it has been declared that only 3% of the voters can determine the outcome because they're the independents. And um, I'm wondering if these alternate uh, voting methods, which uh, encourage multiple parties, produce successful govern, uh, governments um, for instance, in Israel, uh, they had to have a unification of a number of parties to throw out, uh, the, uh, what was it? Netanyahu. <laughs> uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just wonder how successful are governments that are produced by multiple parties as opposed to two party systems? Yeah, that's a huge uh, question. Uh, and there's all sorts of combinations of government, uh, some of them are proportional and some of them not. Uh, you can easily open a can of worms. And you could say that uh, what we're doing with uh, approval voting is cherry picking. Here is one little change that's really easy to do and makes a big difference. We don't have to have a constitutional amendment. We don't have to 
convert to uh, proportional voting or uh, so it solves a lot of problems, but it doesn't, it's not the end all. For instance, gerrymandering is still an issue uh, and you gotta have a good system for handling gerrymandering, but approval voting solves a goodly number of issues uh, for very little cost. Next. Um, uh, Michael. Uh, yeah, a practical question. Uh, first, thank you for this presentation. Uh, very interesting. Uh, but uh, if, uh, uh, in, in order to change the voting system, say in a single city, uh, what would it take? So can the city council uh, decide uh, to use uh, a different system next time for next elections? Or should it be a citywide uh, referendum? Or what, what uh, are the, like, the, the legal legal mechanisms uh, for this. Yeah, yeah that's the sort of practical questions that we're trying to handle right now. Uh, we have to have someone that's a, a lawyer that knows about election law because there are so many little gotchas in election laws that were elect that were enacted 40 years ago and they weren't even thinking about approval voting or any other voting method. So basically that question has to be answered on a city by city basis. Uh, uh, I, I know that uh, um, Texas, for instance, makes it very difficult for instant run and in, runoff voting. And, and uh, um, as far as we know, uh, approval voting is not difficult to implement, but again, you almost have to be a liar to check the rules on every city. Yeah. Uh, Dana. Thank you. Yeah, um, I understand how instant runoff voting works, where if you vote for more than one person for the office, um, uh, and then, then the second runner-up person, the votes roll over to, to whoever gets the most votes in the first place, so that, that those two are combined or whatever. But I really don't understand about with approval voting, if you vote for a whole bunch of people and you say, oh, I approve of him and her and so on. So how does that get uh, toted up at the end? I'm not quite clear on that. Oh. It, it's so simple. Uh, it, it's almost, um, it just goes right by, but you just check every box that you approve of and whoever gets the most checks is the winner. Uh, so uh, if one person gets 57 and the other gets uh, uh, 58 checks, then the 58 uh, check person is the winner. Oh, okay. So nothing rolls over uh, to, uh, from another candidate. Right, you just decide whether you approve of a person or not. No. It sounds kind of vague somehow, if you like approve of a whole bunch of people. I mean, how can you? really make you can't you're not really making a choice there in a way yeah you're just um, getting a general preference it like if you're a, a nader supporter you may want to approve of gore just to cover your bases and vice versa you may you may be a, a gore person and and you know, i sort of like nader i'll give him my support even though he may not win uh, so that's what i mean by uh, multiple approvals. Yeah. So is, the, is that that much different from the way it is now? I mean, oh, whoever gets the most votes yeah. is supposed to win. I mean, I, I really... Yeah, yeah that made a big difference in, in St. Louis and in Fargo. And uh, um, it's, it solves this, the... Uh, uh, it solves the vote splitting problem and reduces polarization. It's just amazing how much such a simple change improves our democracy. Yeah. Mm. Thank you. Yeah, Jeff, oh, I wanted to comment about that. The, the, the thing about approval voting is if you vote for everyone, that's exactly the same as voting for no one. Yeah. You know, and the only way to vote specifically against someone would be to vote for everybody except that person. 
which yeah. is not that bad. I mean, you're relying on the other voters to agree yeah. with you on, on various things. But I wanted to ask about, um, have you looked at all about, I, I think one of the problems, and you mentioned it, is it doesn't stop gerrymandering. Is, is there anyone looking into uh, district free voting or for the whole state? Oh, yeah. And what are the, is there a site we can go to, or, or do you do you guys look at the advantages and disadvantages of that? We've had people present on that at Center for Election Science, uh -huh. and we sort of support that movement. But there, so far, there isn't a simple solution for it. You've got to have an algorithm, and and uh, but we, in general, it's a good idea, but uh, yeah. it's hard to implement. <laughs> it is. It is done in various parts of the world. Um, it could be done. Yeah. Also, the one other countermeasure is is the advantage of approval voting implies that you have more than two candidates. Um, yeah, for just two candidates, it's the same as choose one voting. Yeah. 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 Okay, uh, Celso. Uh, yeah, it seems that um, approval voting has has uh, a significant drawback in that you can't express the strength of your preferences. And it seems that the uh, score-based voting uh, fixes that. Yeah. And you also said that um, the score-based voting and approval voting end up being the same for large numbers of voters. Mm -hmm. So why not use a score voting, which gives people at least a, a, a sense that they're expressing their preference or the strength of their preferences? Yeah, uh, we would not. If somebody wants to put that on the ballot, uh, I would not... Uh, oppose it. <laughs> I don't think the Center for Election Science would oppose it either. It's just that it's only slightly better than approval voting and it's, it's extra effort. Um, so you, you, you might as well go for uh, approval voting when you have more than 100 voters. Uh, if, if your family is voting for where to go to, what restaurant to go to for dinner, then I would recommend score voting. So if it's a small number of voting, then then that difference between a three star and a four star makes a difference. Mm -hmm. When you get up to hundreds, um, it, it, it doesn't make that much difference. It seems that psychologically uh, you could convince more people uh, of the benefits of uh, score voting. Yeah, that psychological thing is an unknown and it, there is there's something to be said for that. <laughs> Thank you. Okay, Zen. Yeah, I'd just like to build on, on Alex's question. What if congressional districts are all eliminated nationwide and had complete at-large voting? Uh, you know, given the sheer size of, of the American populace, would, and, and, you know, in that situation, would single choice of voting actually be sufficient to determine nationwide party preferences? Or do you, would you still prefer approval voting on that scale? Well, uh, California has what, 30 uh, congressional districts, 35 or so. Uh, if we combined them into groups of 10, we could elect 10 congressmen at a time. Uh, there is a million combinations, ways to implement that. And in general, I support that idea, but it's just really complicated when you come down to uh, implementing it. Uh, so again, I'm, I'm cherry picking. I'm just going with the thing that's easiest to implement mm -hmm. uh, rather than try, trying to solve all of our problems at once. <laughs> no, but it seems it will be very easy. You just have single choice voting. And you, I guess the complexity of it is what the drawback is because you would have, I remember that I think it was a 2003 uh, recall election for uh, California governor. Well, we had like 180 candidates and we had to pick one. I guess that's, you know, a large at large voting uh, systems, I guess would produce this sort of, you know, 2000 candidates running for 435 seats in the House of Representatives, for example. But uh, mm -hmm. I wonder if it would theoretically be, be fair uh, as an election system. In theory, uh, it's a good idea, but it, uh, again, I'm cherry picking. I'm just going with the simple idea that can make a big difference. Yeah, your idea is definitely much simpler. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I think we, we've also got the electoral college to deal with, and that's another problem in itself. Yep. <laughs> yeah. So I counted 
uh, after the 2020 election, I went to Santa Clara's elections. Uh, they had 20 uh, races that had three or more candidates and 11 of them were decided with vote splits. Uh, so vote splitting is everywhere, uh, not just at the presidential uh, level, but like the, the mayor of Sunnyvale uh, got in with 36% of the vote. The second place was 35 and then 32. Um, oh, th this is occurring everywhere all the time. <laughs> Zen, you get your hand up again. Yeah, yeah. Maybe this will be my last question. So many countries, countries, including one from which I emigrated, use something called, and I will mispronounce it completely, Londed, uh, L H O N D T start, but you know, it's, it's for parliamentary elections where you count, like, I think, I mean, the only the salient part that I remember is that you have to have a threshold as a political party to even qualify to be on the ballot. Oh yeah. And then if you run as a coalition, that threshold is proportionately reduced to as, so as to encourage parties to run mm -hmm. in, in coalitions, right? Do you think that's a, you know, <coughs> what are the pitfalls there? <laughs> now, at the Center for Election Science meetings, we've spent hours discussing uh, proportional representation and whether we should get into that. Uh, and in general, everybody thinks, oh, that would be an improvement, but it's just so hard to implement. Hmm. Uh, in particular, British Columbia tried to convert to it um, uh, about four years ago, and they couldn't get a majority of the people to convert to it. If you get started with a new country, it might be a good thing. Mm -hmm. um, I know Germany has a combination of proportional and local. Uh, there's so many combinations. Mm -hmm. Could you say California's got this odd thing where the, the top two candidates uh, in the primaries are the ones on the ballot, even if they're from the same party? Does mm -hmm. that figure into your cal calculation somehow? Well, um, th that's an improvement over uh, the old way of doing it. Uh, but with approval voting, we'd actually, I would think that you could just use the top four or, or five or six. There's no reason to narrow it down to two immediately because in the general, you can have four or five and still pick out a good candidate. No. There's, uh, but again, um, um, we're not, uh, the Center for Election Science isn't forcing that on, on anybody. That's just my own personal opinion. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Dana. Yeah, my understanding of that top two business as a green <laughs> is that it was designed to eliminate third parties right at the beginning of the election uh, cycle there. Mm -hmm. at the primary level so that they wouldn't be around to be even represented at the end election. I guess it's been pretty successful doing that. So that seems kind of undemocratic. And yeah. personally, I am in favor of proportional representation. I'd just say that, okay? Yeah, and uh, I can say at the theory level, I'm in favor of proportional representation. Uh, it's just that today I'm talking about things that can be implemented easily. <laughs> and approval voting would greatly help uh, third parties. An interesting story is Andrew Yang, who was one of the uh, main Democratic uh, candidates in the 2020 election. Uh, he, he was on the de debates. Well, he, uh, he stopped being a Democrat uh, about six months ago and formed the forward party. Uh, and he just recently came out in support of approval voting. But the third parties are big beneficiaries of, of the alternative voting methods, but in particular, uh, approval voting. Oh, thank you. And that could be that the major parties won't like approval voting because it re reduces their power. Mm -hmm. It uh, just uh, very slightly. So I think everybody should support it myself. <laughs> Uh, it seems to me though the, the parties are independent entities. Do they get to decide how they vote? Is that something governed by at a state by state level or not governed by at a state by state level? 
every organization uh, gets to decide on its own voting methods. Mm -hmm. So the parties, uh, your, the unions, uh, the water districts, uh, the school districts, everyone uh, can, uh, can convert to whatever voting method they want, but approval voting uh, is the easiest and solves the most problems. I think a possible advantage to the present system over voting, approval voting might be that you, you have more time to examine the flaws of the individual candidates. Of course, it may be too late, but still. That's why one reason why you may not want to do away with primaries. It gives you time to learn about the candidates. It costs a little bit more money and stretches the election out, but you learn more about the candidates for the primary. I would think also finance is a big advantage of, of switching to approval and that it doesn't create much of a change. Yeah. In fact, if you still like to just vote for one, you can still vote for one. Uh, in St. Louis, they voted for 2.1 candidates on average. Uh -huh. uh, but maybe you only have one person you really approve of. Seems to me that what you're doing when you vote for only one is, is did you want that number one or you want to cancel that office? You don't have that option. You're going to have somebody in filling that office. And if you really don't care, who fills it, skip that other item on your ballot. I think I missed some of the question there. Uh, it, it was probably more a weak opinion. Oh. <laughs> it, it, it was if you if you want. Okay, I want Alex to be the. You know, I miss him as being president. I want him to be the president of this organization. We don't get Alex to blow it up, but I'm just voting for Alex. I don't care who else is on there. Mm -hmm. Um. Sometimes that's a valid thing, a way to believe, and, and sometimes it's, it's nice to show approval from multiple people. It just depends on the situation. Also, I would think if, depending on how much party loyalty you feel you have, you might, part of your campaign, say, vote for me, vote only for me. Or if you feel your, your opponent is a bigger danger, you might not say that. <laughs> Uh, that's been proposed too, because humans are tribal animals and maybe we like being polarized. Uh, so uh, if you like being polarized, uh, vote for one is definitely your voting method to use. Yes, at least you know who the good guys are. Yeah. I, I, I just press that you said in where it's implemented, it's usually averages about 2.2 people Per, 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 per vote, per, uh, per ballot. Yeah. yeah. I'm sure it's going to vary from election to election. Yeah, yeah and I, I think, um, but I think probably opposition to, by the major parties might be the biggest hurdle. Maybe. Uh, it probably just um, momentum. The world doesn't like to change, although Center for Election Science now has polled 12 states with thousands of people polled in each state. And we're running about 70% approval across, across the 12 states that we've polled, including California. So it's very popular. It, we just need to, uh, to reduce it from theory to actuality. It makes it hard for the businesses to decide who they should be bribing. Oh. <laughs> I, I think there will be a, a lot of objection from the established parties because that really lessens their uh, power. Um, but uh, I, I think it's most of the people I've discussed it with, they are dubious about it because they don't understand it. And I think it's simply a large part an education problem because I don't see how anyone gets hurt in 
the chances of their uh, preferred candidate being elected, if it's a everybody's vote is to be equal. And sometimes we, um, like right now, say with uh, so the six, is it Sanders, Trump, and Biden? Let's say those are the uh, the people that we have, and I really prefer Sanders. However, I don't think he's going to be elected, so I vote for uh, Biden. Um, and we never know uh, how much support uh, Sanders really had. And um, so you leave out possibilities. Um, but if I can vote for those two and leave out the one that I do not approve of, I've covered myself either way. And so I can, I can show that in the election. And I don't understand the downside of that uh, uh, as a voter. Yeah. You know, the... Uh... Uh, candidates that were elected under choose one voting may not uh, like uh, converting to approval voting. And in fact, some of the aldermen in, in St. Louis didn't like it and tried to get it reversed. And this, the people of St. Louis had to vote a second time uh, to enable uh, approval voting. The second time, 69% of the St. Louis people voted in favor of it. Matt, I see you got your hand up. Yeah. What Whenever I see anything about, uh, you know, vote voting reform in that this respect, everybody always brings up ranked choice. Like I hardly hear any other form um, from people that you know sometimes would expect to to know better. But uh, do you have anything to say about that? You know why that's so much more popular? Like, is there a way to get approval voting? Because I I really do feel like approval voting <laughs> is much better. Yeah. Uh... First of all, the, the, the people that California approves all went through a ranked choice phase that lasted one to two months while we thought ranked choice was the answer. <laughs> so it seems to be um, uh, the first idea that comes to mind. Uh, and it wasn't until we'd thought about it for several months that we started to see the issues with it. And then we, we started to find out that there are other solutions that were easier. Um, uh, the ranked choice people uh, are organized and have been around for about 40 years. Uh, so they've got their name out there uh, a lot more than Center for Election Science and their budget currently is about 10 times faster, higher than uh, Center for Election Science. So we're looking to change that. Uh, we think that uh, approval voting will overtake uh, instant runoff voting. Um, uh, again, instant runoff voting, it, it's no worse than what, well, some people say it's worse than what we have, but uh, then choose one, but. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, I think it's it's only kind of worse, in, to me at least, in that it's a lot harder for the, the voter to like figure out, right? Uh, and easier for them to kind of screw up, uh, so to speak. So, um, but you know, otherwise, it is it is an improvement to, to uh, that's right to the system. Um, yeah, and it does have the center squeeze effect, and it and it get, yeah. and you have to worry about precinct some ability. Uh, but and I guess you know yeah. the last part is you you mentioned a couple of cities that that have approval voting, but um, the ranked choice is anybody actually using the ranked choice, or did I miss that in the talk? Oh yeah, about a dozen cities have ranked choice, including okay. uh, uh, San Francisco and Oakland. Um, so you know, it's used and it it, it will work. Uh, it's just that there's simpler ways that do better. Yeah. Okay. That's all I have. Just out of curiosity, in ranked choice, and I suppose um, other methods also, if you. If you accidentally vote for two favorites um, if, in a paper ballot, say, yeah, I assume that whole ballot would be thrown out. Um, a machine can compensate <laughs> for that. Yeah, I actually heard um, uh, read, uh, an election 
uh, cleric uh, talk about that and they try to figure out what your meaning was. But if they can't throw, figure out what your meaning was, then they, they do have to throw the vote out. Which I see is a disadvantage. Yep. Um, Okay, well, I hope that uh, you sign up for the newsletters for the California Approves as well as uh, Center for Election Science. So you tell your friends in Seattle about to vote for uh, Initiative 134 and, uh, and perhaps uh, donate money, although currently we need uh, activists more than money. <laughs> I, I see Matt has his hand up. Yeah, Matt. Yeah, uh, uh, one more thing. So I'm in Florida now. I don't know if you, you heard about that, but is there a Florida group? There is, but I don't have it memorized. The Center for Election Science website would have that. We had 130 okay. cities apply to be chapters. Um, and so there are a lot of chapters, but uh, I, don't, I don't know about the specifics of Florida. You mentioned a few sites in your talk. Could you put them in the chat? Uh, it'll take me a little while to get them out. Okay. Um, <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, yeah. Uh, the Senate, electionscience.org is the, the best one. Uh, and then californiaapproves.org uh, for the California version. And seattleapproves.org if you want to support C uh, Seattle. Uh, St. Louis approves if you want to support St. Louis. Uh, oh. Uh, electionscience.org is the central place, so that um, that has the most organization currently. I, I assume they would have links to yep. state and local. Yeah. So maybe if you just put electionscience.org in there. Yep, I'll put that in the chat. Uh, I actually already did it, put it in the chat. Thanks, Matt. There it is. Okay. And there doesn't seem to be a Florida chapter. Well, there you go, Matt. You can start one <laughs> in your spare time. Um, yeah. So, uh, fact check me on this, but through the grapevine, I heard that Florida just enacted a rule that made it really difficult to do instant runoff voting in Florida. Uh, I'm not sure about that. I, I'm not kind of keyed into the Florida politics yet. So uh, I can't say one way or the other. I don't remember hearing about that. Okay, and I hate uh, repeating anything that I haven't fact checked. That's the nature of the world right now. Exactly. Yeah. All right, thank you, Jeff. And very interesting talk. Thank you for asking me. Uh, uh, Jeff at electionscience.org if you'd like to contact me. Okay. By the way, if we were to be decided to become active in this, would we, we go through electionscience.org or your specific uh, recommendations? Uh, yeah, you, you have to decide. Electionscience.org is a national nonprofit uh, thing that, uh, but if you actually want to directly influence, say, San Jose converting to approval voting, then California Approves is an actual uh, campaign in California, general purpose campaign that could actually back uh, some initiative in a particular city uh, to convert to approval voting. So you, you decide, maybe you wanna do both, uh, the national one and the, and the local one. All right, thank you.